So Logan's in. Wait, explain to me exactly what he's doing with his body and his face. He's just walking around, but with the slight sense that he might kill someone. It's like Jaws, if everyone in Jaws worked for Jaws. You want to be my dad's little bitch boy? Tell him to fuck off and stay out of my life. The fuck is dad messaging you for? Roman. I sent him a text on his birthday. We have to trust each other here. Stop ganging up on me like you're Lennon and McCartney and I'm fucking George. I'm John, motherfuckers. We are days out from a very thistle, very historic election. Matson is watching. I have plans with the Sibs. Can you swing in for me? And what's in it for me? They have some fucking juice. Apparently, ATN has an open line to Jared Menken's campaign. I want to be the president. And if I lose, I want it correctly characterized as a huge victory. All right. You could do with some help. I have skin in the game. And I have some debts that I intend to repay. It's a very nice place you got here. Uh, who gets to keep it in the divorce? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> This is total lockdown, like the threat of nuclear war. You should be careful, Tom. You just fucked yourself. Did I? If you fuck up his deal, he'd be fucking toast. We're doing what we do together. And I have no idea what's coming. Happy Christmas, you clock-watching fucks. You look tired, and your face is giving me a headache. Oh, thank you. Thanks. It's been fun to play with Shiv and Kendall in a way that we're actually trying to get along and we're trying to be on the same page. Though there has been a ton of conflict between them in the show, all the way through all the seasons, when the three of them get together, they can kind of find those moments of connection. How am I the mature one here? They're so rare, those moments of unity, aren't they? So when we find them, they, they do tend to be memorable. The boathouse in this penultimate episode of season one is one of my favorite scenes. Can I suggest a hug? I'm always really attracted to that glimpse into perhaps a more innocent time, their adolescence, their childish selves. And that's one of the reasons I loved episode one, in that there was a sense of them having a second childhood, if you like. New Gen Royce. We have a fucking song to sing. Even when working together for a common goal, there is still that sibling rivalry of like, I hate you, I want you to fail. It's not like they're hugging all the way through, right? Their manner of interrelating is harsh jokes and taking each other down a peg or two. That's just their family culture. He might go on a killing spree in 7-Eleven and you might get your dick stuck in an AI jerk machine. Roman has this real feeling of what, what he really hopes family can be. And I think he loves the idea of working together and also being a family and doesn't really want to be torn apart. I thought we were going for the hundred. Small, new, fast on our feet. Are you scared of fighting dad? Also, I think Roman's a little bit intimidated, scared to go up against dad in any way. Tom last season says something like, I've never seen Logan get fucked once. And Roman is very aware of that as well. The siblings have survived and thrived, but there's a contrasting energy with Logan feeling so isolated back at his birthday bash. Probably the most depressing birthday party in the history of birthday parties. Meet the fucking monsters. He's obviously in a bad place with three of his kids, and if he was asked whether he cared, he'd say no, but his every gesture, I think, suggests otherwise. There's always an element, there will, there will be a tinge of that regret, because that's the thing that's not resolved, is his relationship to his children. It'd be so much easier for Logan if he didn't love his children. And I think there's a part of them that says, I wish I didn't feel this way, but I do. You're a good guy. Thank you, sir. You're my pal. The scene with Colin in the diner, I'd say, is a quite an unreflective man having some feelings of reflection. Colin represents something which is much more neutral for Logan, because he's not angling for anything. He's just doing his job. It's the one thing that Logan respects, so he feels free with someone who just does the job. You think there's anything after all this? He asks him a couple of questions, but they're really rhetorical questions, aren't they, for him? He's pretty much decided what he thinks about life after death. What are people? And also, he's disillusioned. He's not happy. He's a misanthrope. He really doesn't like where human beings are going, and he feels that they're not worth respecting. So everything is a market? <laughs> I think there's a few different ways of thinking about this show, but one way is certainly about that it's a show about mortality, and that interests me, seeing somebody who has maybe committed quite a lot of capital to not thinking about where all human lives go. And you can keep that at bay for a long time, but no one can keep it at bay forever. Hey. 
I think a few months has elapsed since Italy and where we pick up, and they haven't talked about it. Do you want to talk? The power dynamics and the hierarchy between them has been upended. I hear you date models now. It's quite a complicated situation. I think in the intervening weeks and months, he will have realized she knows. Do you really want to get into a full accounting of all the pain in our marriage? I think it's too sensitive for her to admit that someone played her. There's some things I wouldn't mind saying and explaining. I guess there is a feeling from someone that, you know, they need to discuss it at some point. If for no other reason than for him to sort of stick up for himself and explain why he did what he did. She's always trying to escape any situation that means that she might have to be vulnerable. I don't think it's good for me to hear all that. People have their own versions of her psychology, but for me, I guess she can't quite stand to have been so powerless in that moment when she was betrayed and doesn't want to go back to it, even if it would involve hearing an apology or a, an explanation. In some ways, she finds it attractive, standing up for yourself and, like, fighting back. But I think she needs Tom to be subordinate to her because it's safer that way. I could see if I can make love to you. I don't think so, Tom. She grabs a little tiny bit of power in a weird way, which is not to throw a punch or a shoe or anything or even any words at Tom. To balance the power again, then she has to feel just as powerful with something external from her father, from the family business. Yeah. Yeah. Oh.